can we give it up for your lead pastors, Pastor Justin and Tara? We love and we honor you guys. Thank you for being obedient and seeing the fruit in this season of what God is doing. How many of you guys know God is doing something amazing at Connection Point Church? Hearing the stories of 51 people getting baptized. That's incredible. I don't know. I don't know if y'all realize that's not always normal. And so uh, what God is doing here is really exciting, and let's lean into that. Let's lean into his voice and his prompting and his leading of where he wants to take us as a church community to make a difference in Buffalo, Minnesota. Amen? Amen. Well, as Pastor Justin said, my name is John O'Gates, and uh, I'm a traveling evangelist, and I get the opportunity to travel all around and preach the gospel. How many of you guys know that's a huge honor and uh, for a while, I was for six years a youth pastor in Rochester, Minnesota. Anyone ever heard of the Mayo Clinic? Uh, that was my city for quite a while. Originally born and raised in Minneapolis, graduated college, went to uh, Rochester, Minnesota, was there for six years. And as I was in probably, like just full transparency, the best season of my life ministerially, personally, I was driving home from the gym, ironically, and I heard the Holy Spirit speak to me so palpably and powerfully. He, he literally, I felt the glory of God coming to my car. He goes, Jono, you are going to be gone by the end of the year. And I was like, where am I going to go? <laughs> You're going to give me an indication. And uh, he's like, you'll be gone by the end of the year. I said, cool. Uh, and let me tell you, just full honesty, that year, 2021, was the most powerful prophetic year of my entire life. I've never seen God speak so adamantly and vocally to me about taking this leap. I have written down probably over 170 prophetic words or confirmations about taking this leap. I remember he said, Jono, are you willing to do something you've never done so you can see something you've never seen? And I was like, mm. <laughs> ah, I got a pretty good here, God. Like, do I really got to go? And he said, will you trust me? And how many of you guys know? When God says it, you will see it. When God promises something, he will provide it. And I've literally been in the best season of my life. I've never seen the provision of God like I have in these 16 months. So in January of 2022, launched John O'Gates Ministries. I don't know. It was a weird name, but I had to roll with it and literally been traveling all around and seeing God do incredible, incredible things. And how many of you guys know sometimes God will not meet your expectation because he wants to exceed your expectation. See, our God wants to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all we can even ask, think, or imagine. And uh, I am very excited to be with you guys. I just come from the state of Tennessee, got in late last night. Your boy is engaged. She said yes, so praise God. I, I was kind of chuckling because, man, when I was really processing jumping into full-time traveling and preaching, I had one of kind of my spiritual fathers look at me as I was kind of like wrestling with this decision to leave my church family and to trust God with my life, to travel. Because I'm like, God, who's going to call? Like, I'm nobody. Like, no one's even going to know I'm out here. And, and he's like, just trust me. And I remember my, my spiritual father, he looked at me and said, John, this is the time for you to trust God and take a leap of faith. I said, why is that? Well, he goes, think about it. He goes, you don't have a house. You don't even have a dog. He's like, you don't even have a wife. He's like, you have nothing to lose. I was like, thank you for reminding me how little I've achieved in my life. But I can now say I've officially knocked off one of those. I'm working my way to marriage. So um, I am honored to be with you guys today. And I'm going to preach a message from James chapter 1, verse 19. And uh, I want to preach a message that I would honestly say is a very simple message. But how many of you guys know the most profound things aren't often, I'm sorry, the most powerful things aren't often the most profound, but they're the most deeply personal. And my hope is that this message becomes personal to every single one of us. And we take what God is saying this morning and we go leave and live differently. Can I just be transparent? The one thing I get really tiresome of as a pastor or a communicator of the gospel is literally preaching God's word, people coming into the church on Sunday mornings or Wednesday nights or camp conferences or whatever it may be, and they leave the exact same way that they came in. 
They leave crippled, they leave empty, they leave not filled by the power of God to go out and be who God has called them to be and to go out and do what God has called them to do. And can I just encourage some people in the room this morning? You are doing so much better than you think you are. And God is doing so much more than you think he is. And so James 1.19 says this. This is the James, the half-brother of Jesus, says this. Understand this, my dear brothers. Everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. So rid yourself of all the evil filth in your lives and humbly accept the word that God has planted in your hearts, for it has the power to save your souls. Now listen to this part. Don't just listen to God's word, but do what it says. Woo! I could drop the mic right now, go home, and that would be a good enough word for today. (laughs) How much conflict in our life would have already been resolved if we didn't just listen to the word, if we didn't just listen to some dude in skinny jeans holding a microphone, but we actually applied the word. See, church, we don't have just a listening problem. We have a living problem. We have people who come in and think that the very reason that God placed his spirit in them was for them just to sit in a pew. God did not place his spirit in you so you could go live your life on the couch. God placed his spirit in you so you could be a part of this church. Be a part of the movement of what God is doing all around the world and within Buffalo, Minnesota. So James, he's writing this letter. He's saying, hey, don't be deceived. Don't fool yourselves. Do what it says. Don't be deceived like everyone else. Do what it says. For if you listen to the word and don't obey it, it's like glancing at yourself in a mirror. You see yourself for a moment and you walk away and you forget what you look like. But. If you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says, and don't forget what you've heard, then God will bless you. Come on, somebody. I want a blessing from the Lord. Now, listen to this. If you're in the room, and you consider yourself a follower of Jesus, if you're in the room, and you've submitted your life to Jesus, and he is Lord and Savior of your life, this is for you. He says, if anyone considers themselves to be religious, but does not control their tongue, you are fooling yourselves, and your religion is worthless. What an encouraging last statement. (laughs) Let's pray. We need the Lord. Jesus, thank you so much for this time. God, I pray that you would do exceedingly abundantly beyond anything we ask, think, or imagine today. God, would your spirit come? Would you do what only you can do is change and transform lives? In Jesus' name. Everybody said amen, amen, and amen. Uh, How many of you guys have ever been, like, in an uncomfortable situation? Okay. Some of you are like, my whole life is an uncomfortable situation. Like, me too, okay? Uh, I always seem to be that guy that seems to find himself in the diciest situations possible. I remember my first year as a youth pastor in Rochester, Minnesota. Uh, I moved to this city, and I really had no relationship, like, connections. So I knew nobody, and I did not know what to do with myself apart from work. And so I started to go to the gym, and I really got into weightlifting and fitness and all this stuff. And I remember... Um, I'm a very, like, habitual individual. Like, I, I love going at the same time of the day. I love doing the same kind of things. And I've noticed a thing. Uh, we are all creatures of habit, okay? And so I started to see the very same people attend the gym at the very same time that I did. And so I started to build a little bit of a community, acquaintanceship, and literally connections with the people at this gym. And now I would naturally say, like, I, I would like to think I'm a, a nice guy, you know, for the most part. And, you know, when I meet somebody or when I I know somebody, I naturally, you know, wave or acknowledge or shake a hand or say hello, do something, right? 
Now, I had met this gentleman at the gym about a week prior, and I saw him enter the gym. And so from a distance, I had my AirPods in my ears. I, I waved at him. Now, I waved just being like, hey, how you doing, man? And I'm going to be honest with you. He shouted something back at me, but I didn't hear what he said. Now, his, his, his face looked kind of like agitated, like like annoyed, frustrated, angry. And so I was like, that's kind of odd. I, I didn't hear what he said. So I walked up to him. I said, hey, my friend, I'm so sorry. I missed what you said. And he's, he's curling this way like this. And he looks at me. He goes, what's your problem with me? And I'm like, my, are we talking to the, my problem? He, yeah, yeah. All you're doing is just staring at me. And I'm like, I am? Like, I was just saying hi. Like, he goes, you're a Christian, right? I'm like, yeah. He's like, you're so fake. And he drops the weight and he walks off. And I'm like, okay. Like, someone woke up on the wrong side of the bed this morning. I'm kind of minding my own business, doing my own thing, keeping my eyes down. Because apparently now eye contact is offensive. I'm walking around, kind of doing my own workouts now and, you know this thing called peripheral vision? It's like the eyesight that you can see that's not your direct clarity. Like, I can literally see this dude, no joke, hand on the Bible, death stalking me like this, pacing back and forth, looking at me. Now, like, you know those things where they're like, don't look, you want to look. So I'm like, eh. and right when I make eye contact with the guy, he gets down low. He goes, hello. Context, we're in the dead center of the gym. There's 75 people on these little ellipticals, on these little treadmills, going back and forth. And there's this group of old ladies literally looking at us like, what is going on over there? And I'm like, this dude is making a whole scene in this gym. He's shouting me down, calling me to the carpet. He goes, what's your problem with me and I'm like bro like, we don't have a problem like I was just saying hi he goes no no you and I we got a problem and I'm like no like he's like you want to go outside and fight and I'm like no <laughs> he goes I'm not afraid of you I'm not gonna come into the gym every single day afraid that I'm going to get beat up. And I'm like, by who? Like, <laughs> I'm just trying to say hi. He's looking at me. He goes, you know what? Let's go outside and fight right now. I'm like, stop it. He goes, I'm not afraid. I've, I've, <laughs> he, he literally goes, I'm not afraid of you. I've been stabbed before. He pulls down his shirt. There's a scar across this guy's chest. And I'm like, well, I don't want to be. Like, at least let a brother get married first, you know, and like start a family and like live life a little bit. And how many of you guys know there's some things in life that you walk into that you can't always just walk out of? There's some situations I'm learning when we follow Jesus that no matter how hard we try, no matter how intentional you are, no matter how dedicated or disciplined you are, you're still forced to face what's directly in front of you. You can't avoid it. You can't ignore it. You found yourself in the middle of this season or situation or struggle, and now you're forced to walk through it. You know, one of my favorite questions to ask married couples who have been married 30, 40, 50 years is this question. I ask them, what is the key to the success and the longevity of your marriage? You want to know what like 90% of the couples look, at, look back at me and say? They say, Jono, the key to the success and the longevity of our marriage and its health simply comes down to this one principle. Pick your battles. Pick your battles. Now, me being a young, vivacious, I want to pick every battle. Like, I, I want to pick fights at the small stuff, the little stuff, the stuff that maybe in my perspective, in my immaturity of age, I may not have the ability to see that in the long run it doesn't matter. 
But my question is this, if the success to healthy relationships and a principle in life is to just pick the battles that matter, what happens when the battle picks you and you don't get a say in the moment? What happens when the battle shows up at your doorstep? What happens when the battle comes into your life and you don't know what to do? Because I'm going to be real with you guys. I don't always know what to do because life is hard. Life is challenging. Life is difficult. It's complicated. It's convoluted. There's so many problems that pile up. There's so many issues that begin. There's so many things that keep coming up. And if I'm real, I don't always know how to respond to it. I don't always know how to feel about it. I don't always know even what to do about it. I don't even know how to respond to all of it. And if I'm honest with you guys, there's not just a lot that's happening within my world or your world. There's a lot that's happening around the world that we don't know how to respond to. Because there's a lot that's happening in our culture right now that's hard to handle. There's a lot that's happening in our world right now that's hard to handle. There's all this conflict and chaos. There's all these things that we're uncertain about. There's all these things that we have questions about. There's all these things that we're confused about. And I don't always know how to respond to every opinion that people throw at me. I don't always know how to respond to all the questions that people ask me. I don't know how to respond to all the differing outlets of knowledge that people send me. There's all these voices, all these choices, all these people that are advocating for my attention and I feel like some of us have come into church today finding ourselves in a season of life or a situation currently that you're in the middle of that you don't know how to respond to. It feels overwhelming, it feels confusing, it feels frustrating and you're here today saying what do I do? How do I move forward? How do I become who God has called me to be in this season? How do I become who God has called our family to be in this time? It's like we can work through our past, but like let's be transparent. How, how do we walk out today? How do we process what we're seeing in our world right now, in our families right now, within our own mind right now? How do we work through the last three years where many of us, we're still processing some of the pain that we walk through from the confusion and the complexities across the world, the conflict and, vi and division within our nation. And some of us are still working through the things that we have walked through. And some studies actually tell us that it may take up to 10 years for us to process through um, everything that we went through on a global scale over the last three years. Now, we may never know the full effect of those moments and how they've affected us, but I believe it is absolutely imperative for us as the church of Jesus Christ. Come on, we are the church. We are the body of Christ. I believe it's imperative for us as the church of Jesus Christ to talk about some things that go against the very purpose and the destiny that God has for his people. I believe that the church of Jesus Christ should not be avoiding that which needs addressing. I believe it's time for the church of Jesus Christ to stand up boldly with delicacy, wisdom, and grace. And I believe if you and I as the church are going to step into the space that God has ordained this generation of believers to step into, if we're going to face the very problems that God has anointed this generation to face, then we cannot fear the very places that God has empowered his people to step into. Church family, you will never change what you are unwilling to confront. Whatever the church avoids, the devil's going to invade. And I don't want to be the kind of person, I don't want to be the kind of pastor that's never willing to, to talk about difficult things. Yeah, I want to be delicate. Yeah, I want to be wise. Yeah, I want to be very careful. But at the same time, I never want to be the person that avoids a topic or avoids a conversation or avoids a person because it's deemed too messy. It's deemed too 
complicated. I want to be the kind of person that's willing to sit with people in the deepest pain of their life and say, I may not be able to understand everything that you're walking through. I may not be able to understand everything that you're going through, but I want you to know I'm here with you. Church family, people don't need you to change them. They just want to know that you're willing to sit with them. I believe it is when we sit with people in their pain and we move beyond our own perspective. I believe that's when we start to see restoration come to this generation. I believe that's when we start to see people experience heaven on earth in the church do what it was created to do. And in a time where the world is hurting, and in a time where the world is divided, it's divided over what people think is right, it's divided over what people think is wrong, it's divided over the, the voices that they want being spoken, it's divided over the opinions that people want shared. Everyone wants their voices heard, their opinions known. And in a time where we've never had more access to connection, we've never seen more isolation. It's like our social media feeds are full, but our souls are empty. We're seen, but we're not even known. And so many people have gotten into the mindset that just because you and I disagree means we now have to divide because division has now become the default. And in the midst of all the conflict, all the chaos, all the division, my friends, a divided world needs a united church. A divided, broken, fractured world needs the hope of the church. Our world needs a generation of believers that would stand in the gap, that would be a bridge for reconciliation. See, we don't need any more, we don't need more Christians who are just really good empathizers. I'm sorry. We need some believers that are really good at being compassionate for other people. Because you want to know the difference between empathy and compassion. Empathy is just a feeling. Empathy is just an emotion. But compassion always leads to action. Every single time in scripture that it says Jesus had compassion, it was followed through with action. What if this generation of believers became that generation of believers? Because we have a lot of people right now saying, why doesn't God do anything? Why doesn't God stop all the suffering and the confusion and all the chaos? Why doesn't he stop it? Why doesn't he do something? And I wonder if God is just sitting back in heaven, looking right back at us and saying, I did do something. I placed my spirit in you for you to do something about it. I put my spirit in you to empower you and to equip you. I created you to stand up for people that could not stand up for themselves. But I need you to hear me. When you stand up, you will stand out to criticism. But don't let the people who know you the least define you the most. Don't let the people who forfeit their purpose keep you from walking out yours. We don't need any more unbelieving believers, church. We need some believing believers that would say with God's power, with God's spirit, for God's purpose, we're going to step up and step out. Because here's the deal. My words cannot change your life. But get this, God's word can. My perspective, we all love. But it is only the presence of almighty God that can come into your situation and take you at your worst and literally transform your life. We love our opinions, but our opinions will not change our outcomes. Only Jesus only Jesus can change your situation. Only Jesus can change your outcome. The world needs more believers that will be willing to step up and step out regardless of the criticism or the compliments and be a part of bridging unity in this world. And let me just say this about unity. Unity is not about everyone being the same. It's not everyone about looking, looking the same, sounding the same, or being the same. That's not unity. That's uniformity. Unity looks like diversity. Different backgrounds, different cultures, different 
perspectives, coming together for a common purpose. And let me tell you, if you're not a fan of diversity, you're not going to be a fan of eternity because it's going to be every tribe, every tongue standing before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the only one that can change your life. Now, the reason why I've taken so long before I've gotten to this text to break it down is because I wanted you to see that this text had absolute relevance for where we are today in our world. How many of you guys know the Bible is still relevant? How many of you guys know God still speaks? And I love the book of James because James is a very practical and encouraging book of the Bible. Here's James, the half-brother of Jesus. He's writing to a group of Jewish believers who are now scattered and divided all across the region of Jerusalem. And to be real, what they're going through, these Jewish believers, uh, is very difficult. (laughs) They're literally getting persecuted for their faith in Jesus. To put it plainly, they're getting cut in half. Their family members are getting dragged out on the streets and persecuted in front of their own family. They are getting and walking through the most difficult, the most intense, the most persecuting time of their life simply for their faith in Jesus. And so here is James. He's writing, filled and inspired by the Holy Spirit to write to these believers to encourage them that when everything's falling apart, when things are difficult, keep holding on to faith. Keep holding on to Jesus. Keep moving forward. He's saying, hey, I know what you're going through is difficult. I know what you're walking through is hard. I know it doesn't even make sense. But I need you to know your feelings for today don't have to define your faith for tomorrow. I need you to know what you're walking through isn't a setback. It's actually setting up what God is producing in and through your life. And all of a sudden, there's this shift, there's this this pivot that James takes in his writing. Did you catch that in verse 19? He says, hey, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen. You want to know what the word everyone means in Greek right here? Everyone. Regardless of your age, your background, or where you've been. Everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak. Okay, hold up. Like, what's he talking about? Like, he just went from talking about persevering through the trials they're in to now talking about the power of the tongue that they have. Like, this dude, he's literally writing to a group of Jewish believers who are walking through the most difficult, tumultuous time of their life, and he has the audacity to talk to them about the power of their words? Come on, James. Talk about missing the moment. Talk about not reading the room. Why wouldn't he keep writing to these Jewish believers about how to hold on to Jesus in the midst of difficulty? Why wouldn't he keep writing about how to stay faithful to the finish? Instead, this joker, He comes out here and talks to them about something so small, their words, when what they're walking through is so significant. But I wonder if James, the half-brother in Jesus, inspired by the Holy Spirit, understood something that you and I struggle to understand today. I wonder if he understood that the way that we see the world changed for Jesus does not come from how loud we are, but it comes from how well we listen. This feels controversial. (laughs) Because in a world that says to make change, we got to make our opinions known, our voices and disagreements loud and clear. Everyone wants the first word in and the last word out, so much so that we've lost the art of listening because too many people only listen to speak. They don't listen to understand or hear. 
They listen so they can add their comment. They listen so they can share their story. They listen so they can add their opinion. That's not listening. Listening, listen to this, no pun intended, is the desire to connect to someone's heart over your desire of being heard. That's listening. See, you may impress people with how you speak, but you will truly impact people with how you listen. And I love that this church is named Connection Point Church because you guys are all about connection. Connecting to each other and connecting each other to a real God. You may impress people with how you communicate, but you will truly impact people with your connection. Church, I believe that the name of this church is a prophetic indicator for Buffalo, Minnesota. That people would come into this place and feel such a divine and a supernatural connection to an almighty God that can come into their life and change their life forever. I don't want to be the kind of person that's being, trying to be so impressive with how, how fluent or profound I sound. I don't even care. Y'all aren't even going to remember what I preached about the moment I walk out of the, these doors. But my hope is that there is something that is said or shared this morning that God illuminates in your soul and changes you from the inside out. Man, I want us to leave different today. I want us to be challenged today because if we're never challenged, we will never change. I want God to get into my life, the murky, dark, nasty, disgusting areas of my soul and say, hey, this isn't in alignment with my word. This isn't in alignment with who I've called you to be. This isn't in alignment with the person and the place that I'm taking you into in life. I want God to get up in my business. And I wonder if some of us, I wonder if we'd become less critical if we became more curious about others. I wonder if some of us started asking more questions then starting with assumptions, we would have a little more perspective for where someone's coming from. What if we were the kind of people that didn't just listen so we could share, but we would be the kind of people that listened so we could learn? Because you want to know a key to living a miserable life? Here's a key. Here's a major key. Make it all about you. But you want to know a major key to living a meaningful life? Make it about others. The whole ministry of Jesus was about other people. He came to seek and save the lost. Our goal is to do the same. Make your life about getting to someone's heart rather than always trying to be heard. Pastor Justin, you can come on up and join me as I land this plane this morning. Maybe James, the half-brother of Jesus, had the wisdom and the understanding to see that our impact as believers in this world is not predicated on how quick we are to speak, but how quick we are to listen. Church, there's enough voices in the world. There's enough opinions being shared. Could something so simple carries so much significance. Could, could it be as simple as slowing down the words we say and quickening our willingness to listen? How much conflict would be avoided if we were better listeners than we were speakers? Who? How much drama would be resolved if we were better listeners than we were speakers? How much healing would take place within our marriages and families if we were better listeners than we were speakers. See, I don't want to live my entire life so busy trying to communicate a point that I miss out on connecting with people. Then James has this final moment, I like to call it like a mic drop moment, you know what I'm saying? He goes a few verses later in verse 26, he says, those who consider themselves religious, so this is us, if you love Jesus, 
yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues. In other words, anyone who does not watch, monitor, or keep an eye on what they say or hello somebody how they say it, because you can say the right thing in the wrong way, deceives themselves, and their religion is worthless. That word worthless in the Greek communicates something of uselessness. Something that's empty, something that has no point, no meaning, no value anymore. So this is powerful. James isn't just trying to step on our toes. He's trying to step on our tongues. He's trying to get us to see church. When you're going through the hardest season of life, and you're going through the hardest struggle, don't forget that the world is watching. The world is waiting to see how we respond in this moment. Our words, church family, have the power to bring life and the power to bring death. And I've seen so many believers lose credibility for the kingdom of God from the things that they've typed, from the things that they've said. How many of you guys know some people do more damage with their thumbs than they ever will do with their tongues? What if we were the kind of church that didn't jump to Facebook to talk about the world's problems, but we went and ran and sat with people in their pain to move beyond our perspectives? See, the world is watching. The world is waiting to see how we as the church respond when the world is falling apart, when our worlds are falling apart. They're looking to see, is there a difference? Is there a shift in the way that they approach life and they lean and trust God? Because some of, some Christians can be the most vocal about what's not going on in their life. And they put more emphasis on their problem than they do their God. Don't give the devil another foothold. What if we started talking about our God more than our problems? What if we started talking more about his faithfulness more than the issues we got going on in our life? Because here's the deal. Like, I, I, I don't want to be that kind of person who's, who's so busy trying to prove something to somebody else that I miss out on connecting to the people that God has placed all around me. Because y'all remember that story of the gym, the guy that was like coming at me, hating on me? Yeah, y'all didn't think I was going to come back to that. I am. Don't you worry. I left tension high. So here I am, the dead center of this gym. This dude is coming at your boy, like straight up chewing me out for seven straight minutes. It turns out when you're getting cussed at and chewed out for seven minutes, it feels like an eternity. I'm sitting here in the dead center. All these people are just staring at us. No one came to help. Thank you, guys. I'm sitting there trying to de-escalate. Like, I am a lover, not a fighter, okay? Like, I'm like, bro, like, let's just hug it out. Like, it's all good. So I'm sitting there, and I'm like, dude, this dude is just getting more revved up. I can't de-escalate him. And so I literally had this thought. I just thought to myself, literally in my head, I just thought, Jesus, I need you to show up. How many of you guys know when you invite Jesus into your situation, he will always exceed your expectation? The next moment, I felt the presence of Almighty God come into the conversation. The next thing I see is a face that looked agitated, aggressive, now looked very confused. He stopped and he goes, are you really just a nice guy? I mean, yeah, bro, like that's what I've been trying to say. Like, gosh, he's like, you really don't have a problem with me. And I'm like, why would I? Like, I was just saying hi, next time eyes down. Like, he goes, you're a pastor, right? And I'm like, bro, I can be whatever you want me to be. You want me to be a custodian? I'm a custodian. I will be the best custodian you ever had. You want me to be a businessman? I will be the best businessman. But yeah, I'm a pastor. He goes, I grew up in church. And I'm like, he's like, I grew up in church. He goes, but let me tell you, I've never been more hurt by anyone in my life than church people. So I left the church. 
He goes, I saw so many people literally standing in a pew, lifting their hands to God, saying God is good, but then they're going home. And the way that they lived their life on a Monday was not the same as what they said on Sunday. He goes, so I, I left, I walked away, I've been kind of backslidden for a while, and literally just starts unpacking his whole story. And I felt like while he was sharing a story, I felt like the Lord gave me a word of knowledge. So I said, bro, how long have you been on drugs? It's a miracle your boy didn't get punched. <laughs> He's just sharing his heart. How long you been addicted? It's like, okay, great. Uh, he stops. Tears start to fill his eyes. He goes, I've been hooked on pain meds for the past three years. He goes, three years ago, I had open heart surgery. This joker did get stabbed just by a surgeon. He goes, I was having heart issues, and I had to use the pain medication to even function, to move. I was so self-reliant. I became so reliant on this that I couldn't do anything. I still can't. Like, I literally can't sleep if I don't have it. I can't do anything. I looked at him. I felt like full of faith. And I said, bro, I believe that God wants to bring healing and deliverance from those pain meds today. This dude literally starts breaking down, starts hugging me in the middle of the gym. Imagine all the old ladies on the elliptical, like, what is going on over there? Like, why are they, like, I got to share God's heart for him. I looked at him and I said, bro, God has so much more for your life than you even want for your life. And I started sharing who God is in the gospel to this guy. Like, and he, it was so funny. He looked at me, he goes, how have I never heard of this before? Like, I was literally just telling him about how much God loves him. Like, God's heart for him. And he's like, why has no one ever told me this? I'm like, I don't know. Like, this is the gospel. That there's no mountain he won't climb up. There's no walls he won't kick down. There's no place that our God won't go to get to you. And he's looking at me. And I'm looking at him. And I'm like, bro, what's you, what are you doing after this? He's like, well, uh, probably just going to head home. And I said, you want to go get Chick-fil-A? Praise God. And I said, dude, I want to hear the rest of your story. Let me tell you, I had the opportunity to sit with this guy for over an hour and a half and hear his whole life story. This dude rededicated his life to Jesus, got replugged into the church in Rochester, and is still active in their young adult ministry today. Now, church family, hear me when I say this. I'm not saying all this to pat myself on the back, but I'm trying to make a point to you that you may not be able to control what happens to you in life, but you can control how you respond to what happens to you. Multiple people can go through the same thing in life and have totally different outcomes by the way that they respond. You want to see healing come into your marriage. Be quick to listen and slow to speak. You want to see God bring revival to this world. Be quick to listen and slow to speak. God has not given you his spirit so you could sit on the couch but be a part of the movement of his church. There's so much more for us that God has. For us to become and for us to do. Don't buy the lie that your role is just to show up on Sunday and sit in a pew and leave the same way you walked in here. God wants to do something in your life today. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to ask you a question. I believe that we have moments where our humanity has an opportunity to meet with God's divinity. And in a moment, I'm going to ask you just to respond on the outside to maybe what God is doing on the inside. Because I believe when we respond, it becomes all the more real. And if you're in here and you say, you know what, John, there is some areas of my life that have not been in alignment with God's word pertaining to this text. I want to come back into alignment. I'm not living the way that God has called me to live. I'm not like, I'm not speaking the way that God has called me to speak. And today you're saying, I want to come back into alignment. I want to be walking in the way that God 
has spoken for his church to operate. And I want to be a part, empowered by his spirit, to do what he's called me to do and to become who he's called me to become. If you're in the room and you're saying, this message was for me, I want you to lift your hand. No one looking around. I just want to know who I'm praying for. Jesus, we see every hand raised, every person in this room. God, I pray your spirit would come. Your spirit would fill. Your spirit would renew. God, I pray that you would begin to illuminate right now the areas that you're speaking to people. God, would you show them the right way? God, I pray for uncomfortable situations in our lives, for us to trust you, for us to invite you into our situation, and for us to truly become who you have called us to be. So, God, we love you, we honor you, and we worship you today. In Jesus' name, everybody said Amen, amen, amen. Come on, can we stand to our feet one more time? Pastor Justin's going to lead us in a little course before we are dismissed this morning. Come on, let's lift our hands and worship today.